Um, let's see, or I'll just, uh, I guess, get going. I'll give myself an introduction. My name's Claude Playmate. I'm the engineer and uh, chief observer at the Big Bear Solar Observatory. For the telescope has been in operation now for a bit over a decade, and we've gotten rather used to referring to ourselves as the highest resolution solar telescope in existence. Uh, however, that has recently changed. Many of you may have seen the um, press releases from the National Solar Observatory's four meter telescope, the Daniel K. Inouye telescope out in Hawaii, that recently got first light. So unfortunately, I think we're going to have to reconcile ourselves to just referring to ourselves as the second highest resolution solar telescope in existence. So today I'll talk a bit about our telescope, uh, what it is, what it does, and um, how it compares and its association with uh, DKIST and some of the other solar telescopes around. I probably don't need to talk to this group much about um, solar astronomy, why we do solar astronomy. Of course, the sun is the only star we can see in detail. The sun is vitally important to all life here on Earth. It provides an ideal laboratory for understanding high energy physics. Uh, and in general, our telescope, we look at the solar surface out through the chromosphere. We're really not a solar interior observatory. We really don't do the corona. We'll talk more about that. But what we really strive to understand is the generation and the distribution of magnetic fields and to pre and ultimately the goal would be to be able to predict and understand eruptive phenomena such as solar flares, coronal mass ejections that disrupt power and information transmission here on Earth. So where is Big Bear Lake? Now, I hope you can see my cursor. I'm planning to use that like a pointer here on the uh, screen. And um, down here, this is a map of Southern California. Down here is the LA Basin. And up just sort of northeast of uh, LA is the San Bernardino Mountains. If we zoom in a bit, here's the San Bernardino Mountains with here's Big Bear Lake right in the middle. For those of you who buy bottled water, there's Arrowhead Lake over there. And if we zoom in a bit more to Big Bear, here's Big Bear Lake. And just in the center of the lake on the coming out of the North Shore, you'll see this uh, straight line. That's a thousand foot causeway with our telescope at the end of that causeway. So why on earth would you put a telescope out in a lake, other than it being quite scenic. Well, Caltech back in the 60s wanted to a world-class observing site within a drivable distance of the campus. Uh, the so Calif Southern California mountains were already well known for good stable astronomical scene as demonstrated by Mount Wilson, Mount Palomar, Mount Laguna, things like that, all these fine observatories we have here in Southern California. Southern California also, of course, enjoys good weather statistics, although it's a little chilly up here in Big Bear today. I'm wearing my fleece. The astronomer Robert Layton had an idea that uh, the lake water up would suppress the ground layer heating that uh, causes thermals to rise up around your daytime telescopes. Anybody that uh, has tried to observe during the day, you understand that uh, necessarily we're observing during the day, the sun is beating down on the ground, the ground heats, you get thermals rising up around your telescope, that damages your observing, uh, your astronomical scene. Well, Bob Layton's idea was the lake would hold down that uh, that ground heating and uh, maintain the natural good astronomical scene throughout the day. And I popped up a few of our images just to demonstrate, yeah, it actually works. 
okay, the image of the Earth there is not one of our data products. So I put that in to compare that to the size of that sunspot there. Well, a site survey was conducted back in the 60s, and it was determined that Big Bear Lake turned out to be a fairly ideal observing site for a solar observatory. Uh, Professor Hal Zirin would develop the site and was named the, uh, the director of the Big Bear Observatory. The first light or the first generation of telescopes for the observatory were two 10 inch telescopes. Well, this was long before my time here, but uh, I found a couple of pictures. Uh, the two 10 inch telescopes were mounted in this uh, common spar with uh, the light coming out the back end to the image plane behind here where you see these two 16 millimeter film cameras. And uh, ahead of the film cameras, I do recognize these two uh, Leo filters. These are Halle filters built back in the day. Uh, we still have these things around. I've seen them before. So inside the uh, in tube were these two inch, two 10 inch telescopes. The mounted on top was a obviously a third telescope. I believe I've heard that this was called the Singer telescope. I'm really not sure. So uh, long before my time at the observatory, I can't tell you too much more about it. And here's a uh, image of a plaque that used to be out on apparently on the outside of the building that shows our relationship back then, at least to uh, Caltech, Mal Wilson and Palomar observatories. And with a little sign that says, the purpose of the observatory is to study the sun. It is located in the lake to reduce the image distortion by heat rising off the ground. Please do not disturb the observer. I wish I knew what happened to that sign. Well, the second generation telescope in around 1972, there was a telescope built for Skylab 2. Remember Skylab was our first uh, US space station. It flew, it had a uh, UV solar telescope, did wonderful solar astrophysical work. And a 26 inch reflector was designed for the follow on Skylab 2. Of course, Skylab 2 never actually flew, which meant there was this orphan telescope. Somehow Hal Zern got his hooks into that telescope and convinced NASA to send it to Big Bear for testing. Well, that telescope was mounted on the same mount that the original twin 10 inch telescopes were mounted. And uh, it had to be mounted inside a large vacuum tank on top of that poor little mount. And my God, let's just look how over, overloaded that poor mount looks. But that was a superb telescope for them. They, there was a workhorse telescope that uh, went from 1972 through 2007. Uh, after it was decommissioned and uh, removed from the observatory, it was then donated to the LA Astronomical Society. And a couple of years ago, I had an opportunity to visit down at uh, Griffith Park, Griffith Park Observatory, and they pulled out the telescope to allow me to see it. So here it is in its current configuration. They have it on an altazimus mounting. They were taking it out for, um, for solar uh, for public observing there at, uh, at Griffith, but I believe their plan is to eventually relocate it to their dark site. Okay, um, finally, Zirin decided to retire in 1997. At the time, of course, Caltech was heavily invested in their nighttime astronomy programs developing the 10 meter Keck telescopes over in Hawaii. So they took that as an opportunity to divest of their solar assets, which included not only Big Bear Solar Observatory, but the Owens Valley Radio Solar Array in Eastern California. A request for a proposal was issued by Caltech for operation of BBSO. 
And of all places, New Jersey Institute of Technology wrote the successful proposal. Well, that seems like an odd mix, but um, several of the faculty at the New Jersey Institute of Technology's Center for Solar Terrestrial Research had done their postdocs, or excuse me, their doctoral research at Caltech and were quite familiar with BBSO and uh, understood its potential. So the, the astronomer who headed that up, Dr. Phil Goody, um, was the PI on that proposal, which was the winning proposal, and was named as the first NJIT director at Big Bear. Okay, so here's our alphabet soup for, we are of course the Big Bear Solar Observatory. We are a field site of the Center for Solar Terrestrial Research at New Jersey's Institute of Technology. So uh, Phil became director 1997, right towards the end of the 20th century. And about that time, there were many future plans in solar astronomy. For one, the Japanese were developing and had plans for a half meter solar space telescope called Hinode, as well as the National Solar Observatory, my previous employer, was making plans to develop a four meter solar telescope, which just finally two decades later has seen first light out in Hawaii. So, Phil's problem at that time is with a, just a 26 inch 0.65 meter solar telescope, how could Big Bear continue to be relevant and uh, compete in the 21st century? Well, he knew he had to think big, but how big did he need to go? Well, as we all know, in telescopes, size matters. Bigger is always better. The more collecting surface, of course, allows you to see fainter sources, fainter objects. That's uh, a bit secondary when you're looking at the sun, but larger aperture also increases your resolving power. And I hope most of you are familiar with this uh, equation. Uh, the resolving power in radians equals 1.22 times the wavelength divided by the aperture of the telescope. So um, if you hold wavelength uh, at just one, uh, stably at one wavelength, say the middle of the visible, I plot here the res resolving power of a telescope versus the aperture. And not surprisingly, as you go to larger and larger aperture, you can resolve finer and finer detail. Your resolving limit is a smaller, smaller angle on the sky. On the sky. And already here at, a, um, at a, an eighth of a meter telescope, that's five inches, you're already able to resolve an arc second. That's pretty good. Go up to a 10 inch quarter meter telescope, you're down at a half arc second. And here with, um, Hinode at 0.5, arc, uh, 0.5 meters, down at a quarter of an arc second resolution. Uh, go to a meter, and of course you're down in an eighth of an arc second. That sounds great until you realize we sit below an ocean of atmosphere. The turbulence in the Earth's atmosphere limits the, res the effective resolving power here at the Earth's surface. And even at the best sites on the Earth, your resolution is limited to about a half an arc second, give or take. Of course, there are instances where that can be beaten a bit by lucky imaging or uh, back uh, speckle interferometry, a few things like that, but still it's a reasonable rule of thumb. So you could say that uh, as you increase your telescopic resolution, you hit this floor here at a half arc second. And beyond that point, well, you might say anything above 
about a quarter meter telescope, a 10 inch telescope, it's just wasted aperture. So it's not coincidental that the first generation telescopes at Big Bear were 10 inch refractors. Um, to beat that limit, of course, uh, you can lift your telescope into space. Space has effectively perfect seeing, but space is exceedingly expensive. Uh, the rule of thumb I've heard is about three orders of magnitude. So say you have a million dollar telescope, you want to loft that into, tele into space, add three zeros, your million dollar telescope becomes a billion dollar telescope. Well, uh, we just don't have that kind of money in solar astronomy. What can you do? And here is a, a bit of a cartoon showing what we're talking about. You have some uh, astronomical objects sending out uh, wave fronts that are effectively perfectly flat wave fronts. Here you have your telescope above the atmosphere. It's able to uh, take that flat wave front in and make a perfect diffraction limited image. However, here we are, poor us on the Earth's surface, the wave front passes through that last 100 kilometers for us after 93 million, 150 million kilometers moving through space, the last 100 kilometers, that wave front gets distorted and we have a fuzzy image. What to do? Well, the answer comes in the form of adaptive optics. Adaptive optics was first conceived of back in the 1950s by a couple of astronomers at Mount Wilson here in Southern California. But uh, try as they might, it was impractical to develop before the advent of high-speed digital computers. The concept, however, was not totally forgotten. And in the uh, late 70s and 80s, the Department of Defense began developing the concept in secret. Then in the late 80s, they at least partially declassified the concept. And in a, of course, uh, adaptive optics is a talk in itself, but in a nutshell, the idea is here over on the, on the left, you have your perfect wave front coming in. It passes through the atmosphere, again, in that last 100 kilometers of travel and uh, comes out in some randomly distorted shape. Of course, keep in mind, it is a random distortion and it changes moment by moment. Uh, neglected in this uh, cartoon is uh, in here somewhere, you'll have a telescope, but we can ignore that fact. That uh, distorted wavefront is then reflected off of a deformable mirror that under computer control with actuators can take on just the proper shape to cancel out that wavefront distortion, reachieving a flat wavefront. That flat wavefront is then sent on down to your science camera where it's able to image to, if the adaptive optic system is properly designed and running, down to the diffraction limit of the telescope. Well, there will be some residual uh, wavefront distortion, on, even on that corrected image, that then is um, some piece of that wavefront is picked off by a beam splitter or dichroic mi mirror, something like that. It goes off to a wavefront sensor that determines what that wavefront, the residual wavefront error at that moment is. A computer then takes that information, decides what, how, how much voltage needs to be delivered back to each actuator of that deformable mirror to take out the residual distortion that makes that correction before the sky has a chance to change and around and around in that servo loop it goes. Uh, the difficulty is those corrections must be computed and applied faster than the sky has a chance to change. And how fast is that? Well, it depends on your site, your telescope, the winds, et cetera. But a rule of thumb is maybe around uh, at least a thousand times per second. Here at Big Bear, our wavefront sensor uh, corrects at just shy of 2,000 times per second. Um, so yes, a, an adaptive optic system can correct to the diffraction limit of a telescope. 
quote unquote, as good as in space. But the caveat is over a very narrow field of view. And I can describe that very, very simply as think about the fact we are sensing and correcting this flat wavefront, how it is distorted here. But imagine off on the side of your field, you're looking off this direction, off the, going through a different part of the atmosphere that gives a different distortion. So the correction you apply will only apply to this particular direction and will apply less and less as you move away from there. Uh, here's an image of the actual deformable mirror we use at Big Bear. It is a small, only 100 millimeter um, circular mirror. We put a pupil image of the telescope focused on that. Oh, I guess it doesn't help the point with my pen. On to the front of this. And uh, it's a very thin piece of glass, only about a millimeter thickness, uh, which is mounted on 357 actuators. Out the bottom of the optic, you can see this, uh, this umbilical of all those wires. Those are all connected to separate actuators for the deformable mirror. And how does, how does, how well does it work? Well, um, I hope you're able to see this on your side as a reasonable, it's not too choppy of a, uh, of a video. Here's a reasonably bad seeing day. This is a uh, 40 arc seconds across of our the natural scene on, as I said, a fairly poor scene day. Switch on adaptive optics and this is what you get. Okay, a dramatic improvement. You can see granulation, the intergranular region. You can even see magnetic, magnetic bright points between the, uh, the convection cells. But we're not done yet. Uh, each of these images we show is actually a stack of 100 frames taken extremely quickly. In post-processing, we can apply a method called speckle reconstruction, which pulls out the finest detail at every pixel across that. Now, I, I better be hearing lots of oohs and ahs out there across the internet at the moment. For me, this is a, a incredible movie done here. And um, you can see dramatic detail in here all the way to the edge, uh, down at the resolving limit of our telescope. Those small bright points between the intergranular region, you're approaching a tenth of an arc second there. So this really is um, diffraction limited across there. I'm not going to say much about speckle reconstruction, but uh, it is a, think of it a bit like lucky imaging where you're picking out the best detail through a stack of images, but instead of picking the best image, you're picking the best pixel through all, through all that and reconstructing the image that way. It's not a very good description, but kind of gives you an idea. Sorry, Clyde, I don't mean to interrupt there, but I know what's going to happen next. They're going to ask, can you get that software to do the, uh, the despeckling? Uh, the, the software we use is proprietary. It was written by uh, the Kiepenhauer uh, Institute for Astrophysics or Solar Astrophysics in Germany. Um, but I think there are some algorithms out there somewhere. If you could figure it out, you could probably do it. But no, it's not a commercial product that is made available. Yeah, because I, I mean, obviously, deconvolution in this particular case is not going to help. I mean, I got to admit, that's the first time I've ever seen that. And I, I can see it now. People, there's a couple of comments already popping up because uh, there's a slight delay on the stream. But I know people are literally just freaking out over seeing that right now. It's I've never seen that before. Uh, yeah, well, uh, I would suggest uh, doing some looking Google, the speckled reconstruction. And um, it is a, f inside solar astronomy, it is a fairly common, although fairly recent uh, technique. And it's certainly not just us that use it, the Germans use it. Um, and I know that they are using it heavily at uh, DKIST now as well. 
Okay, so the question was back to Phil's conundrum of how big is big enough? Well, uh, any next generation telescope would have to fit within the confines of the existing facility. It would be completely impractical to build a new larger building. Uh, the cost would be prohibitive. Plus the just the permitting here in California would be uh, probably impossible to get through. So any new telescope would have to fit both within the, the space and weight limits of the existing structure. Also, remember the sun is not a solid object. The sun is gaseous. And so the surface, although it appears sharp to us from 150 million kilometers away, it is actually rather somewhat diffuse. Um, the photosphere is a few hundred kilometers thick. So there is going to be a limit to how fine the finest detail on the solar surface is. There are some suggestions that that is some tens of kilometers across. So, so call it uh, 50 kilometers in the visible, that'd be about 0 0.07 arc seconds, which already dictates at least a 1.5 meter telescope would be required to re hit that limit in the visible. Well, um, back when Phil was first proposing this telescope, there already was a 1.5 meter solar telescope. This is an image of um, the McMath Pierce Solar Telescope out at Kitt Peak. I'm well familiar with that facility. I uh, was with that telescope for 26 years before uh, becoming a turncoat and coming to Big Bear back in 2011. So if there's already a 1.5 meter telescope, I'm sure there was some uh, wish to, why not just make it the world's largest and push it just above 1.5 meters. And lastly, uh, at the time, Big Bear, or the National Solar Observatory, was in the beginning process of uh, designing the four meter Daniel K, you know, what is now the Daniel K in a way telescope out in Hawaii. Uh, Big Bear was intended to be a quick up, fairly low cost pathfinder technology demonstrator for the four meter telescope. And uh, a good chunk of the development money actually came from the government for that purpose. Now, the primary mirror. Uh, the University of Arizona in Tucson uh, is in the process of developing, I'm sure you've all heard of the Giant Magellan Telescope, one of those next generation giant telescopes uh, to being built down in Chile. Um, the GMT is going to use seven 8.4 meter telescopes or 8.4 meter mirrors. And remember, when you do a composite mirror like that, it has to, those seven mirrors have to work together as if they were a single parabolic mirror. So they have to be the proper shape, they have to be in phase, etc. So around there is one mirror in the center that is symmetric, that's a standard parabola, but all these uh, mirrors in the six mirrors in the petal, the flower petal arrangement around the outside are segments of a parabola, an off axis segment. You can't just take a uh, parabola and tip it on its side. You have to actually grind that mirror as if the as if it was a part of a larger parabola with these optical axis over here and that shape going off over there. Um, so before they could tackle the 8.4 meter mirrors, they needed to demonstrate that they could actually produce such an off axis parabola. So Big Bear made a deal with the University of Arizona to share costs. The University of Arizona, the U of A got to develop the processes for figuring and testing such an off-axis mirror, and Big Bear got the mirror. 
So our BBSO 1.6 meter parabola is a one fifth scale model of a GMT mirror. Now, again, back to that primary mirror. The primary mirror is a daughter segment of a 5.3 meter parabola. So think of a 5.3 meter, 17.4 foot parent parabola with a, uh, with a 1.6 meter section cookie cuttered out of it. That's not the way it was produced, but conceptually that's what it is. And it's uh, made of ultra low expansion Zerter by Schott. Uh, that's one of these very low expansion uh, ceramic materials. And that is used such that, uh, you know, of course, for a solar telescope, there's going to be some absorption and heating into the, uh, into the substrate. So we don't want the telescope mirror to, when it heats, to change its shape. So we want it dimensionally stable. And we're using an off-axis uh, optical system to avoid any obstruction in the optical path. So it's a fully unobstructed beam. The beam comes in, reflects off the primary, comes to a primary focus over here off to the side before hitting our off-axis secondary mirror and sending the beam on down to our Coudet lab. Um, diffraction, well, for a stellar telescope, it's not that bad. You already know what a star looks like. It looks like a dot. Who cares if it's uh, got little diffraction spikes on it? You can still find the centroid of that. It still has a lot of light. But on an extended object like the sun, every resolution element in that image is going to have diffraction spikes. So what you'll find is it will make a diffuse halo or diffuse glow, which will decrease the contrast of your object. While the sun is a very bright object, it's a surprisingly low contrast object. So that is paramount that that be maintained. Also, it's an all reflective system, which allows us to observe both in the visible and the infrared wavelengths where most transmissive optics become opaque into the infrared. Now, we use a Gregorian optical system. And to a lot of you astronomers out there, you're probably going to find that surprising since uh, Gregorians are, have a reputation of being optically inferior to Cassegrains and like Ritchie Critians. Well, on a Ritchie Critian or a Cassegrain, you have a, con a convex secondary mirror ahead of your primary image, which then sends the beam back through a castle to to uh, your, your image plane behind the mirror. For solar work, we want to have access to that primary image. So we use a Gregorian. In a Gregorian, what you have is a parabolic primary that forms a, a primary image. Beyond that image, there is an elliptical concave secondary, which then sends the beam on down. That gives you access to a real image of the of your image plane here. Here's another optical diagram showing our optical system. And here we have access to that primary image. Now, the reason for we want access to that is think about the fact that I heard uh, Jen talking about uh, people worried about a 150 millimeter telescope uh, needing an energy rejection filter. And then her talking about somebody was uh, running a 16 inch telescope without an energy rejection filter. We're running a 63 inch telescope without an energy rejection filter. Now, uh, 1.6 meter, 63 inch, that uh, equates to 2.01 square meters of collecting surface. Now, I, a lot of you may have heard of the solar constant, the sun. Fortunately, we orbit a very stable star. Even between solar maximum, solar minimum, the output of the sun only varies by maybe 0.1%. So the sun is constantly beating down on the Earth with about 1.36 kilowatts per square meter 
of energy. Um, that's above the atmosphere. Coming through the atmosphere, there'll be losses, reflection, scatter, et cetera. But I figure somewhere in the ballpark of a kilowatt per square meter is still striking the Earth's surface. That means that our telescope is collecting up two kilowatts of power and concentrating that down into a focus 36 millimeters across. That's enough heat energy that it will melt metal. How do we handle that? Well, at our primary focus, ahead of our number two mirror, our secondary mirror, we have a highly reflective aluminum surface. This is, it's about an inch thick. It's hollowed out inside, polished on the front surface, and uh, through which we constantly circulate uh, water coolant, water glycol coolant, to keep it from melting down. And you might see right in the middle of that reflecting surface, there's a small aperture, which is three arc minutes across. That's about a tenth of the solar diameter. So a tenth of solar diameter reduces the energy load by, um, by 100. So I figure through, the, uh, through that aperture, we're still passing only about 20 watts of power onto our secondary mirror and on down to our science cameras. Keep in mind that that aperture is only reducing the field of view of our telescope. It's a field stop, not, a, not an aperture stop. So it still has the full resolving power, full brightness, et cetera, that the telescope has to offer just at a reduced field. And over on the left here is an image. Um, we have a webcam. Since we are extremely concerned about maintaining control of where our telescope is pointing at all times, if the sun is to ever get off of that aperture, it would do damage to other parts of the telescope depending on where it hit. So we have a webcam that is constantly looking through a cheap solar filter that I bought that one of the companies online. I think it's one of the Mylar ones I put on the front of a webcam just to look at that heat stop. So here we are. This is our primary focus for the telescope. Uh, this is the heat stop around it. And you can see that three arc minute field that we're looking at through there. Now, again, it is paramount that we keep control of the telescope and know where that's where that uh, where the sun is striking at any time. Around the periphery of that heat stop, we have an array of um, temperature sensors. If any of them ever see anything awry, any strange readings, it will open up a solenoid here that will allow this spring to pull up a stainless steel cover to help protect the surface for some time, at least enough time to figure out, get things under control, close the mirror cover, what have you. Now, there was an incident I always like to point out before I came to work at the observatory in the early period of developing the telescope, where that actually happened. There was a cloud that came through the, um, through the beam the telescope got confused, the drive went off, but the mirror cover did not close. The stainless steel plate, which we sometimes refer to as the slammer, came into the beam, the clouds passed by, and here is a 36 millimeter infrared image imparted onto stainless steel. I'm told that was exposed to the beam for about probably 30 seconds before it burned through the stainless steel. We keep this around to remind ourselves of what we're really dealing with. Since then, of course, we've replaced the stainless steel plate and uh, we have not repeated that incident. We have many more safeties in place now. So, to first of all, to shoehorn the new 1.6 meter into the existing facility, that original Hem classic hemispherical telescope dome was replaced by a 5 8 34 foot 
five five eight sphere, which is actually a modified radar dome. So it is lightweight, made out of fiberglass, that kind of thing. It's not metal, and it rotates and has an iris that can raise and lower to track the sun. The mount itself was manufactured, designed and manufactured by DFM Engineering up in Longmont, Colorado. It's a modification of their standard 50-inch telescope mount. Here's a engineering drawing, and uh, well, you can see it sort of looks like a, uh, a standard telescope mount. Below the telescope, we have two CUDE labs for uh, instrumentation. One floor below is uh, dedicated to our mid-infrared instrument. Two floors below is our adaptive optics and uh, our near-infrared and visible instrumentation. Um, we do have a flexure in our telescope through the day. And being that this is off-axis, an off-axis system, the orientation, not just the collimation and focus, but also the, the relative rotation of our mirrors are critical. So to take out uh, aberrations due to flexure through the day, our secondary mirror, which is a off-axis elliptical mirror, is mounted on a hexapod. These are four uh, rods that can uh, translate, giving us six degrees of freedom. That would be uh, rotation, tip, tilt, uh, X, Y, and Z location to take out the different uh, possible aberrations that we see through the day. Our mirror cell. Well, again, we have a thin, it's only 100 millimeters thick, 1.6 meter mirror. In reality, it's a 1.7 meter physical mirror, but it is so far off axis, 1.7 meters would produce an elliptical pupil image. So we stop that down to a circular 1.6 clear aperture. Um, that is mounted in a 36 point passive flotation cell. You see each of these blocks on the back of the mirror cell. Each of those is a five pound weight that is mounted on a 10X force multiplying lever system. And the weights are adjusted up and back on the, on the lever to just support the mirror, what we call floating the mirror. Now, imagine when you're looking at the zenith, of course, that works just fine and you could figure out the amount of force you need to support the mirror. But as you go to different points on the sky, the amount of force you need to support the mirror is going to change. The nice thing about this design, which goes all the way back to Mel Wilson again, um, the same change in gravitational vector that applies to the primary mirror also applies to those levers. So it automatically uh, compensates as you track to different points on the celestial sphere. Um, the mirror cell was designed for active optics. Each one of these little uh, mounting uh, holes on the back of the mirror cell were meant to hold uh, electric actuators that would back up the lever system to fine tune that. It was found, however, that once the telescope was put into operation, that it just wasn't necessary. So it was never put into operation. And as an engineer, you can, you can well appreciate that uh, if you have a working system, the last thing you want to do is tack 36 servos on the back of it. And our declination system is a little bit different than most stellar telescopes. Now, since we are dedicated to looking only at the sun, we have a limited declination range that we're going to look at. The sun only goes between zero to plus and minus 23 and a half degrees across the, uh, in, across the, uh, the seasons. So we don't need to be able to point anywhere arbitrarily just over that range. So our declination drive system is a simple screw jack 
Over here, we have a screw that just moves the telescope up and down through that range, and that is found to be adequate. Now, remember I said that there were severe space and weight constraints inside this facility. To accommodate this off-axis optical system, here's our primary mirror, comes off to the side here where our heat stop is here, the secondary mirror here. I, you can see my cursor, right? Okay, good. I, the, so our actual optical axis is way over here at the edge of the telescope. Now there's a third mirror here, which sends the beam through our declination bearing here off to a fourth mirror that then sends it down through the equatorial axle here, down, and then on down to the Coudet lab. So our declination, one of the modifications to this mount from a standard telescope mirror is normally you would have long forks coming up to the center of mass of the telescope up here, you would have the declination bearing up here, right at the center of mass of the telescope. Well, for this optical system, the declination bearing has to be way down here at the side of the telescope. So the bearing is here, center of mass is up here. You would think that, okay, well, you would need some big counterweight way down here to, uh, to balance that. Well, First, there is not room in the dome for that. And secondarily, we're already pushing the limits of the telescope pier in weight. So that was a non-starter. So the DFM came up with an interesting idea. Instead of counterweighting the telescope, it is constantly off balance. And it is supported on each side by two screw jacks that compress against a spring inside a cylinder here. We know how much force is needed to be applied to support the telescope. Those, uh, and so we know how much that spring has to be compressed. The computer takes care of that. And uh, so we are constantly riding on a spring suspension instead of having a, a, a balanced telescope. In the longitudinal axis, front to back on the telescope, the telescope is balanced. We have two 600 pound counterweights that ride up and down actively as the telescope changes in declination inside these two tubes. And here is just an artist uh, cutaway, artist uh, illustration cutaway of the telescope to again give the uh, idea of the of how the structure works, our optical axis over here at the side of the telescope, the polar axle here, the beam gun sent, sent down to the infrared and visible near IR Coudet labs down below. I'll also take the opportunity to point out this small dome we have just to the north of the telescope along the causeway. Uh, that houses a 100 millimeter, it's a 1.5 meter focal length, full disc H-alpha telescope. Now, I'd love to tell Jen that uh, we use a Daystar filter. Unfortunately, it's not. It's, a, um, it's an old Zeiss filter. It's a Leo filter from the 1960s, Quarter Angstrom. Incredible filter. But uh, we use that mostly as a context imager, um, looking on the disk. If there's uh, some eruptive phenomena on the solar disk, we can use that for pointing information to get to quickly. Okay, the telescope, that 26 inch space telescope that was the workhorse telescope for the BBSO was in operation from 1972, removed in 2007. So that's a, what a 35 year run. It had a good run now down at uh, with the LA Astronomical. First light for the 1.6 meter new solar telescope was May, 2008. Um, we first uh, science, I think, was several months later in 2009. I came to the telescope in 2011. Um, in 2013, our first NJIT director, Phil Goody, retired. And so our current director, Dr. Wenda Chow, uh, we decided to have a 
ceremony and rededicate the telescope with uh, to Phil. So the telescope in 20, July 2017 was rededicated as the Goody Solar Telescope. So now the GST. And here is a uh, image of the plaque that's now affixed to the side of the telescope pier. Um, all day long, you've talked about the different atmospheres of the sun, so I think I'll blow through these slides pretty darn quickly. The outer atmospheres of the sun, of course, you come to the photosphere first, 400 kilometers thick, that shows sunspots, granulation, etc., about 5,500 Celsius. Uh, after that, the chromosphere, which uh, is often uh, characteristically looked at in often in H alpha at 5563 angstroms, taking um, using special filters like the uh, superb filters that Jan over at Daystar produces. And uh, I actually do think they're superb filters. We have a couple, couple of those running around the house here. Yeah, chromosphere, a couple thousand kilometers thick, characteristically, uh, at the base going from about uh, 6,000 degrees up to 20,000 Celsius. And there you can see uh, flare phenomena, uh, plage, filaments, prominences, which are all magnetic features. Uh, here's a couple of, I should point out that uh, filaments are these dark structures on the surface of the sun. When uh, viewed, instead of against the bright surface of the sun, viewed against the dark uh, sky behind them, appear as prominences at the limb. And here's a couple of uh, images I stole from uh, the well-known imager, Randy Shivik. I hope if he's watching, he doesn't mind me stealing his images off the net. And the outer atmosphere is the corona. The corona is a is extremely tenuous and faint, uh, extending arbitrarily far out from the sun, only visible during eclipses or using very specialized telescopes known as chronographs, which uh, need to be above a predominance of the atmosphere and actually best done from space. Uh, characteristic of the corona is its extremely high temperature and uh, shown in the corona are, well, magnetic loops, coronal mass ejections, streamers, things like that. Um, unfortunately, Big Bear is not a coronal site. We are just too low. We are only at about uh, 2,000 meters, uh, 6750 feet here. We have just too much atmosphere above our site to be and a uh, viable chromos or coronal site. It is expected DKIST should be. Now here is an early image, which I kind of call the proof of the pudding image for, for Big Bear. This is a comparison of a simultaneous image taken between BBSO's now GST and that half meter Hinode Space Telescope taken August uh, 2010. Now this is not a simulation blurred or anything. These are actual images from both telescopes. And you can see the comparison that, uh, yes, we are certainly beating a half meter telescope, even though it's a space-based telescope and achieving diffraction, diffraction limited images here on the Earth's surface. So for the time at least, it was outperformed any space or earthbound telescope and able to achieve the true diffraction limit of the telescope. And up at the upper right, just for a comparison, I put in an outline of the continental US. Now, fast forward a decade to the Daniel K. Inouye's first light image announced on uh, December 12th compared to that same early BBSO image. And yes, if you look at it carefully, they are beating our resolving power. Down here in these bright points, which are uh, magnetic features in the intergranular region, 
you can see there, are, there is more detail down in there than we are showing. So yes, 40 meters is working and they are getting slightly better resolving power, it appears, than we are. However, they're also using newer generation uh, speckle reconstruction code than we are and hitting it a little hard. So it's, it would be interesting to go back and, uh, and revisit some of our earlier work here. Now for a side-by-side -side comparison between uh, the Goody Solar Telescope and the Daniel K. Inouye, which uh, again, I'd like to point out that this was built as a quick up pathfinder demonstrator for the four meter telescope. So in a lot of ways, they are very similar systems. How am I doing on time? Oh my goodness, I'm running out of time. I better pick it up here. Um, the Goody telescope is a 1.6 meter, of course, DKIST, four meters. We have an equatorial telescope, uh, equatorial mount. Theirs is alt -hazimuth. And then we come down to re resolving power. Our diffraction limit in the middle of the visible is about 57 kilometers on the solar surface. They're down at 23 meter kilometers. Um, out of one and a half meters, uh, excuse me, one and a half microns in the infrared, we're down to about 170 kilometers where they're still at 68 kilometers. Now, I think this shows an interesting comparison and uh, obvious future collaborations is while they could observe this astronomically interesting line at about 1.5 microns, they would have the same resolving power as we could achieve in the visible. So taking simultaneous observations, I think that shows some obvious collaborations there. Um, first light for us, 2008. First light for DECAS, December 2019, about 10 years later. Um, our heat stop has a three arc minute aperture and reflects two kilowatts of power. They pass five arc minutes, so a larger field of view, but with that larger aperture telescope, they have to, their heat stop has to absorb more than about 12 kilowatts of power. That, uh, that's a frightening number there. Uh, our CUDE lab is fixed, which means we have a field rotation at our image plane, which we take out with software, 15 degrees per hour. Being an altazimuth, they have a variable rate uh, image rotation, which they take out by rotating the entire CUDE lab on kind of a uh, merry-go-round type of arrangement. Uh, we have a suite of visible IR imaging spectral and spectral polarimetry instruments, along with multi-conjugate adaptive optics. Their first generation instruments will be heavily based on our instrument suite. Our altitude is about 2000 meters. They're about 3000 meters, thus making them hopefully a viable coronal site. Uh, the BBSO GST was developed over five years for about $25 million. DKIST took 20 years to develop with a, uh, the best official number I could find was $344 million. Uh, operations budget, uh, we're about a million dollars per year. They're gonna be about $18 million per year. Now, I mentioned multi-conjugate adaptive optics. Um, Multi-conjugate adaptive optics is the next step in adaptive optics. Uh, Solar MCA, MCAO has been a joint project between BBSO and the National Solar Observatory because it will be needed for DKIST. The first test bench was developed here at BBSO. And over on the right, here is a, a uh, panorama of our CUDE lab. Most of our vis IR instrumentation is on the benches below. The benches above are all dedicated to MCAO. Now, what is MCAO? Well, instead of having a single deformable mirror, it uh, uses multiple deformable mirrors to correct for different atmospheric layers. In this, in the case here, three different multiple mirrors 
deformable mirrors correcting for three different layers on the atmosphere. And what that does, it doesn't improve the image correction, but it allows a broader correction across the field. Now, here's an image of what is already now being called classic adaptive oxygen. So already jumped to MCAO. Stand by one moment. I hope it's not terrible if I go over time here. <laughs> Jen did. <laughs> Um, here you see classic adaptive optics where the correction angle is maybe 15 arc seconds at most, 10 arc seconds, depending on the scene. Then go to the multiple adaptive DMs, the MCAO. You can see that's opened up to about you know, maybe 50 arc seconds. So a dynamic difference. It uh, will be very nice for us here at the BBSO, but with the large aperture of DKIS, it will be absolutely essential. Moving along, other notable hey, Clark, solar... Yeah, uh, real quick, don't feel compelled to be rushed because the next person that speaks is me and we can delay me for as long as we need to because this is far more interesting. Well, I appreciate that. I hate I hate when I run over. I try to keep the time, but... That's uh, okay. You can run over all you want. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, then I'll take a sip of water here. Other notable solar telescopes include Gregor, another telescope we collaborate with quite a bit. Uh, Gregor is a 1.5 meter on-axis Gregorian solar telescope. It is a Gregorian for the same reason we are, but uh, they decided to go with the simplicity of designing an on-axis system instead of an off-axis system which probably makes for a much more rigid, they probably don't have nearly the, the flexure we do, but they do have diffraction due to all the uh, spider structures in the beam. Um, the telescope resides uh, in the Canary Islands on the island of Tenerife at an altitude of about 2,400 meters, so a little higher than we are. It also has a high order adaptive optic system using 256 actuators. So very comparable to our 357 deformable mirror here. It's developed by, oh boy, I always obliterate this pronunciation, the Kiepenhauer Institute for Sonnenphysik, the German astrophysical group, which normally we just use the acronym KISS for them because it's a lot easier to pronounce. They had first light in 2012, but uh, they originally started with a silicon carbide secondary mirror. Uh, they wanted silicon carbide because it is extremely light and rigid and has very good thermal characteristics. But apparently um, there were a lot of problems, I think, with the surface roughness. They just were unable to get it to perform well. That was changed out in 2018 for, with a Zurader secondary mirror, same material we use here. And uh, since then, uh, they've been getting rather good performance out of it, and I think is finally performing to its design spec. Although being very close in aperture to us due to the diffraction, it probably will never quite meet the, uh, the image quality we get here at Big Bear. Um, Oh, and here is a close up of the secondary mirror. And ahead of that, the, um, their heat stop. So unlike us with the heat stop off to the side, they rely on the beam coming in around the side of their heat stop, having a say small, just a small like Cassegrain obstruction in the middle of their, of their beam. And then the Chinese Large Solar Telescope. Now, for many years, the Chinese have been um, laying, talking a bit about developing and building a 1.8 meter solar telescope. Very little information has been released about it. Uh, very little is known about it. They've been very tight lipped about it. Um, however, I was recently um, shown a picture, which I don't know if that person was supposed to actually have. Um, and uh, I'm not sure if I should have done a screen snap of that. So uh, 
I'm not sure I'm supposed to have a picture of it, but I didn't feel comfortable showing a picture of it. So instead I had uh, Teresa and my wife do a quick sketch of it to give you an idea at least what it looks like. Um, it's a, it is a 1.8 meter Gregorian. It's located at a temporary engineering and development site in uh, Shengdu, China. Um, eventually it's expected to be moved to a much better site somewhere at a higher altitude. And just recently the, the Chinese Academy of Science announced they did achieve first light on December 10th of uh, 2019. So apparently, as far as I can tell, this is now the second largest solar telescope. Although um, they've gotten first light, I don't think they have all the adaptive optics. I haven't seen a data product off of it. So I'm still holding on to Big Bear being the second highest resolving power solar telescope until they can uh, get the development finished on this telescope. It'll be very interesting to find out more about this when they finally do release some more information. From what I see, it appears to be modeled heavily on Gregor, but I'm afraid that's about all the information I have on this thing. Now, on to the data products. At any observatory, the observatory staff has to remember what is the point. A manager of mine once uh, told me what you need to do is think of this like a business producing a product. What is the product? The product is not the telescope. The product is not the technology. The product is not the observatory. The product is actually the data. Everything else is secondary to just producing that data. And who are the customers for that product? The customers are, of course, our, uh, our scientific faculty back at NGIT and in general, the broader solar astronomical community. So with that in mind, what is really the most important point here is not the telescope, the site, but the end result. Now here we have an early movie from our broadband imager. This is a photospheric image taken in the red showing that with adaptive optics, the telescope is able to achieve diffraction limited images, not just once or through lucky imaging, but through extended periods through the day. Uh, can I replay that? Oh, oh what? Ah. Okay. Um, oh, there we go. This is uh, about uh, 75 arc seconds across, so making that about 54,000 kilometers across there. And again, you can see these bright points in the intergranular region. You all, you all know what the granules are. That's the material flowing to the surface convectively. It gets to the surface, it releases that energy, and then fall, cools and falls down in the intergranular lanes between them. Well, keep in mind that material rising up is plasma. It carries magnetic fields with it. So if there is an unbalanced magnetic field, when that field is concentrated in the intergranular region, you are going to concentrate that magnetic field. So in these regions, what you're seeing is these brighter areas where that magnetic field is being concentrated and actually pushing those granules apart allowing you to see down a little deeper into the solar surface. Now here is an image taken from our H-alpha imager known as VIS, the Visible Light Imaging Spectrometer. It uh, shows, of course, H-alpha shows the chromosphere well. Um, up in the chromosphere, the hydrogen is trapped and traces out the magnetic field lines in the chromosphere. So this is a line center taken, I mean, right at the center of the uh, H alpha line. And uh, this, I should say, well, I'll, I'll wait to describe it till I go to another next frame here. But the important thing here is to note how H alpha traces out nicely the magnetic field lines in these regions above the magnetic active regions. Okay, now here 
is a scan using this, the visible imaging spectrometer. This instrument uses a Fabry-Perot interferometer, which is very analogous to the etalons that Jen produces over at Daystar with a couple of important differences. First of all, instead of being reflective surfaces coated onto a solid substrate, the, um, this is two reflective surfaces on, on plates that are separated and uh, controlled through piezoelectrics actuators, allowing us to change the position, the spacing between them very precisely and very, very quickly. And what I mean by quickly is on the order of milliseconds. So this allows us to trace through the H alpha line or whatever line we're on, typically H alpha, very, very quickly. And with it, with the adaptive optics holding it stably, we're able to trace out from on band to off band. Now, as you are off band, you're looking through the H alpha line down to the chromosphere. As you come into closer and closer to line center, you, the line is becoming more and more opaque. So you're being looking higher and higher into the chromosphere. As you're looking off band, there are still H alpha features that are Doppler shifted due to either falling in towards the solar surface or falling out. So by scanning through, you get the uh, velocity information about the flows in and out from the solar surface. Um, now here is a movie of the H alpha center line not well produced and yeah here yes we have fringes etc that was not taken out in this but i wanted to show that to show just what you get from umbral oscillations propagating up through the magnetic field lines up into the chromosphere and then simultaneously looking in the op band we're looking in the red wing showing that material falling back down onto the surface. If you looked in the blue wing, you would see material flowing outward. Also, here's, a, here's an image I made, which I just think is spectacular, beautiful. It's a Doppler gram taken from that same data product from the this, the visible light imaging spectrometer, where I took off-band red and off-band blue images. I think I used the 0.4 angstroms off-band combined with the center line image. I colorized the red wing red, blue wing blue, and the center is yellow. So, which you, so by being able to shift the wavelength exceedingly quickly and having adaptive optics holding the image stably, you can combine these to show the flow. Red here is material falling back down onto the surface. Blue is material fall, flowing upward. Yellow is uh, stationary, basically. And uh, well, I'm just quite proud of this picture just because it came out so pretty. But this is a demonstration of what would be called a Doppler gram in H alpha. We also have our near infrared inf instrument the near-infrared imaging spectrometer, NIRIS, which uses fabry Pros also, but uh, sorry, Jen, we use stacked fabry Pros. so um, call us what you will. Um, she's going to call you a baby. <laughs> yep. Uh, she's probably called me worse. <laughs> um, anyway, we use uh, stacked uh, fabry Pros to narrow the line further. Uh, we are looking at a line here at uh, 1.565 nanometers. That's about three times the wavelength of yellow light, which is an iron line that is very sensitive to magnetic fields. Um, the spectral line under the influence of magnetic fields will begin to broaden and eventually split into two components. One component will be due to one polarity, call it negative magnetic polarity, the other to the other positive polarity. By measuring the amount of splitting 
and the polarity of those spectral lines, one can deduce the magnetic field. But to do that, to fully deduce the, not only the field strength, but also the orientation of the magnetic field, you need to look at the, the optical polarity. Oh, I should mention those two uh, split beams are oppositely polarized. One will be polarized circularly that way, the other, the other direction. So by characterizing the different polarization states, one can deduce and map out not only the magnetic field strength, but the magnetic uh, orientation and position, that sort of thing. So Myris, which is using stacked Fabry Perot, sorry, Jim, um, is, uh, can be used as a spectropolarimeter. Uh, Nyrus can also be used as a two-dimensional imager. Uh, this is changing the wavelength from 1.565 nanometers to 10830 angstroms, uh, just, just into the infrared, just beyond the visible. There is a helium line there that uh, is formed, unlike hydrogen alpha that is uh, pretty much in the chromosphere, the helium 10830 line is at the very top of the chromosphere. So this is a good proxy for what's happening at not only the upper chromosphere, but into the lower corona, which we can't see at this elevation. So here is a, a, a movie taken a few years ago, back when we used to have sunspots. And um, it's of a flare, it's rather important to be able to, okay, let's wait till this comes through again. By using this, which is much op more optically thin than hydrogen alpha, it's easy to trace out the magnetic field lines along the plasma here and see the magnetic orientation before the flare and then during the re, um, reconnection through the flare, be able to map out the, uh, the resultant uh, field configuration after the fact, which comes out to be a fairly nice arcade after that. Moving along since I'm well over time. Uh, here is back to our uh, broadband filter imager. It's uh, just a high speed CCD with a filter, uh, 10, uh, 10 angstrom wide filter at uh, centered at 70, 57 angstroms. So it's a photospheric image showing Again, a well-developed sunspot with several um, light bridges across there. And this really shows what you can see with extreme resolution on the sun. Those bright points down in the umbra are many of them around a tenth of an, a tenth of an arc second, so approaching our diffraction limit. And uh, well, at least back when I was an undergraduate, um, we believed light bridges across sunspots were just that. Uh, we thought that it was a bright bright material suspended magnetically above the sunspot. Well, in high resolution, just a casual look tells you that ain't true. Um, you can clearly see that uh, this is convection worming its way up through the magnetic ropes that make up the, uh, the sunspot umbra. So you have convection here. You can see the development of the penumbra over here and the movement through that. You can see flows up there through. Anywhere you look in this image, there are fascinating things going on. I've gotten lost just staring at this movie. And then uh, here was a, a movie of uh, the Mercury transit on November 11th. We use our adaptive optics to lock onto Mercury as if it was a, uh, a dark sunspot and uh, had to hand track across the sun, but use that to lock. And uh, that worked quite well. It makes a very pretty movie. Unfortunately, our uh, that speckle reconstruction code doesn't know how to handle this uh, data set very well. So you can see like there's kind of a bright box around the uh, dark planet. And as you get to the limb, the uh, reconstruction code really breaks down and goes nuts. But uh, that was a 
nice uh, experiment that was uh, we got some data off of and able to use some things. Also notice as you go across the sun, the sun is always in motion. You can see actually those five minute oscillations actively as you're scanning across the sun there. So another, another movie you can just get lost in looking at. Um, oh, and here is a movie put out from a paper that was put in science back in November that shows the importance of comparing data across several different observatories. They compared photospheric and chromospheric data to, taken from BBSO to coronal data taken from the uh, SDO, the uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory. So what they did was they traced the bright features on the solar surface, correlated those with magnetic fields up through spicules in the uh, or, um, uh, features in the chromosphere up to the features continuing on up into the corona here from SDO images. So that uh, shows that these features in the corona can be traced all the way from the corona down to magnetic features at the photosphere. So a nice paper and uh, a nice uh, demonstration of the importance of multispectral campaigns between various observatories using different instrumentation. Here's the same data set visualized differently, magnetic fields at the bottom, the uh, photospheric image movie there with the chromosphere above that. And uh, tracing into the SDO data up at the top. Okay, I'm finally almost done. I like to finish off with uh, this picture, it's not a great image, but it's one I took several years ago here. Um, and I think it's just pretty. It wasn't a great seeing day, but uh, I just thought it was a particularly pretty image. So I colorized it and I call it the bumblebee. And yeah, I just show it because I think it's pretty. And lastly, I thought I should say a few words about uh, BBSO during the uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have just resumed observations. We had been shut down for several weeks with all of us uh, hunkered down in our bunkers at home. But um, we came up with a plan to allow us at least to limitedly start operating the telescope again. Over the last couple of weeks, we've been bringing our instrumentation back online, testing the telescope, getting it back online. And uh, within the last few days, we have restarted data observations. Um, we are only allowing a single staff member in the dome at a time to operate. Um, it's a lot for one operator to be able to handle, but there are about there are three of us that are to the point where so long as nothing goes wrong, nothing really breaks, uh, it is possible for us to operate solo. So, and as I told my wife Teresa here, um, I'm really more isolated there in the dome than I am here at home. Here at home, I see her. I can be at the dome and not see anybody all day long. Uh, yes, tours. Tours will resume someday. Um, what I suggest is you maybe check our webpage for any updates. I will admit that um, with all of us sequestered away from the observatory, keeping the, the webpage up to date has been uh, a low priority, but hopefully we'll start getting some things out there at some point. So yeah, if you wanna find out more about BBSO, check our webpage. And with that, uh, thank you. All right. I appreciate you doing this. Uh, do you want to end the screen share? So we, oh, you already did. So let's go back into the yeah. gallery view. Um,
not many questions because to be totally honest i just kind of feel like most of us are just flawed right now it's oh. unbelievable um oh. i was not expecting that i will admit this I, I i've seen things now that i can't unsee and it makes me want to actually just get back out in the sun and dial dial in my edelon because i'm starting to realize i might actually have been off on some of the tuning because now i know what i'm looking for obviously i don't have that kind of aperture <laughs> but uh i think jen was pointing out uh don't be afraid to also explore say you're looking at h alpha don't ex don't uh, be hesitant to, to explore off band. You can often see features off band that are not going to be obvious in the line center just because, well, you're looking at the top of the chromosphere. Um, down lower, you start to see some of that, those flows, et cetera, and you can see a lot of it, very interesting detail that way as well. So, um... There is one good question here is, is it possible for amateur astronomers to detect magnetic polarity of sunspots? Uh, that would be difficult. You would probably, the, the only thing that comes to mind would be you would need a, a high resolution spectrometer and see if you could measure splitting. There are a couple of lines in the visible that do show the splitting is called a Zeeman splitting. Um, and it is possible with a high resolution spectrograph, one would have to develop a pretty high resolution spectrograph to measure strong magnetic fields by the broadening of that line. In the visible, you're probably not going to see a truly split one, but may just maybe. Hmm. That would be an interesting thing to try. I think one would probably need a pretty high resolution spectrograph, maybe fiber fed, something like that. Right. Might be out of the realm of possibility for most people's um, limited wallets. <laughs> or uh, there, there are some clever amateurs out there that have done some very nice uh, DIY projects. I wouldn't put it, I, I would not say it's impossible. Oh, totally. Uh, Matthew Henry is asking, can you explain the active uh, primary mirror balancing system on the DKIST? On DKIST? Um, I don't know very much about it. I do know that uh, the, unlike us, we've gotten by with a passive system, but on their mirror, it's also, it's extremely thin. It has, I don't remember how thin theirs is, but uh, being four meters across, it has to be, have a, met, a matrix of actuators that actually control the shape of the mirror. And uh, active optics conceptually is very similar to adaptive optics. The only real difference is the time domain. In adaptive optics, you need to correct, you know, like I said, in the kilohertz range. And for that, moving the primary mirror is just not possible. The inertia of that much class, you can't move that quickly. But for adapt, excuse me, for active optics, you're just trying to take out the deformation as the telescope points in different parts of the sky. So the time domain is very different, something more on the order of seconds or even minutes compared to kilohertz range. So it is done very similarly. They have some kind of actuator. I don't know what their actuators are out there, but uh, they just have to be able to push and pull. They have a wavefront sensor then that measures the distortion off of that mirror and make the appropriate corrections. The details I'm, I haven't looked at. Uh, these are more comments than everything, anything else. I think a lot of people here know who you are, obviously. Um, Jan from Portland, Oregon, Leo. Um, oh, geez, I can't pronounce that name. Cava. Kevin Yero. Kevin Yero, there we go, thank you. Um, Hi, Leo. They hope that you can make it to the Patagonia eclipse in December. We're hoping to go down to Argentina for the eclipse and uh, Leo has invited us down. Uh, we're just hopeful that uh, this pandemic will be over and we can still make the trip. Um, 
right now my head is just like swimming with so much things that are going on um once everything is opened up what can one expect from doing a tour at the um, observatory well um again we're a very small staff and as you can see from our pictures it's a very crowded uh environment inside the dome uh, we've had to shoehorn a 1.6 meter 63 inch telescope into what was originally designed around a couple 10 inch telescopes. So space is a premium there. We do have to keep tours to an absolute minimum. Uh, plus there's a lot of exposed equipment, etc. So what we have done is we have partnered with the Big Bear, Ast Big Bear Valley Astronomical Society. Um, my wife, Teresa, is the president, and um, they provide docents to act as tour guides to the observatory. During the, uh, the summer season, when it's not an ice rink getting out to the dome, we have two, usually two, two tours per month. Um, to sign up for that, one goes to our webpage and uh, clicks on that little link. And uh, you can sign up there or call our admin assistant. And what, what you get for that is um, you'll be meted at the gate, escorted in, um, give a talk about not too different from what I probably said about the observatory here, uh, brought down, shown uh, not only the BBSO telescopes, but there is also the National Solar Observatory gong instrument at our facility, shown the small telescope then brought into the dome. And uh, once inside the dome, brought through, shown the observing room. Oh, I didn't think to uh, take a picture of the observing room. I guess I should do that some sometime for a talk like this. Uh, gone, go up to the dome, of course, see the telescope. And um, if time, if we're not too busy. Uh, myself or uh, my colleague John Varsick try to come up to the dome and give a short talk about the telescope answer questions, that sort of thing. Uh, we say the tours last about an hour. Sometimes they, well, I'm known for running on a bit, so they can last a little bit longer. Um, the caveat is that the telescope is down a thousand foot causeway, which is a gravel walk. Vehicles are not allowed out there. So uh, wear comfortable, safe shoes and be prepared to walk that distance. Then inside the dome, you need to be able to make it up and down three flights of stairs. There's no elevator, etc. cetera. Um, the data that you guys collect uh, and this is probably the big thing for most people at this particular point in time right now is, is it accessible to the public and can I have a go at processing it but, uh, is, is a good question. Uh, yes, again, with caveats. Um, we are a private observatory. We are not um, a public observatory like National Solar Observatory. So our data first go to our principal investigator for whichever observing program we are doing. Those principal investigators have a, uh, a proprietary period of, I can't remember, six or nine months where they get first crack at that data. Um, there are a couple of our data products such as the, I think the broadband imager and our H alpha center line are considered public from the start. They go after we observe through the day, overnight, those data are transferred into our, our archive servers where they are backed up both on disk and on tape. And then it is sent off to our data pipeline for the speckle reconstruction. That can take upwards of a day, sometimes if we're really busy, we can get backlogged by a few days. Once they are in the, the archive as processed data, there is a form on our webpage that allows one to go and request data. So unfortunately, it's not set up 
conveniently for an amateur to go in and browse, but we do have some products in there that allow people to go through, see what data has been taken, look at our log, and, uh, and it is conceivable that if there is a particular data product that has been taken and is now public, that one can fill out the data request form and uh, get that image or those images. I will say that right now, with everybody hunkered down at home, um, it might take a while to for us to respond to a data request like that. Yeah, um, this is a this is a question that I personally am asking. How does one get into what you do for a living? I mean, how how do I mean? Obviously, you know, going through all the science degrees and so forth and so on, but. I guess what I'm saying here is somebody who's watching this video and says, that's what I want to do for a living. How do you get that person into it? Um, historically, there have been different approaches. Um, since I am part of the technical staff, there have been different paths into astronomy through the side door, so to speak. I happen to have a master's degree in astronomy, so uh, I have a particular uh, angle that I, I take care of. But uh, for in astronomy, just like any industry, we have a need for many different talented people. So the first thing is, of course, try to get a background. Uh, best is try to get some college background, astronomy, physics, etc. Very good. But also uh, practical experience. Uh, at Kitt Peak, where I used to work for many years, quite a few of the technical staff were ex-military who had uh, electrical experience from the military, that sort of thing. Programming. Programming is becoming ever more prominent as a as a need in astronomy. Um, so the main thing is um, follow your passion, follow your interest, and keep after it. Brilliant. OK, um, if there's no more questions, we have got a 15-second uh, delay, roughly. Um, so if you guys want to just fill in your questions, I will be doing my talk at some point today. Um, I, I will have to go for a break, because I have been here since 8 o'clock, my time. Um, here in in Los Angeles, so I've been sitting here for quite some time. Um, Clyde, thank you very much. I'm so glad that we had you on here. Uh, I'm oh. so glad that Tiffany recommended you to do this talk. I got to admit, like I said, I wasn't prepared for what you were going to go into, and to, just to be quite honest, I'm just so blown away right now. It's just like I'm almost speechless. It's like, it's so crazy. Well, I'm. I'm a hardware guy. I have been accused through my life of being a telescope hugger all my life. So that's uh, kind of the direction I come at it from. And just let me say thank you to thank you for having me and uh, thank you to everybody out there. Um, this is a difficult time. S stay safe, stay well, and uh, we'll see what comes next. Yeah. And it's good that we get to do these live presentations at the end of the day, because otherwise, where you guys would normally have the outreach, you wouldn't be able to reach out to anybody. And it's good to have stuff like this. So, I think we're all learning a lot of lessons through this, that there are different avenues we haven't really uh, that much investigated in the past. I think I don't think going back to normal is ever going to be the normal we saw before. I think we're learning a lot about seeing different avenues to do a lot more. I mean, technology, I, I gotta say this though, technology has so drastically changed the way we do things. I mean, I'm talking about from the early days of solar astronomy by the Chinese who used to just like build fires to make smoke and they would purposely put wet bamboo in there to smoke it out and try and look at the sun. Uh, oh, well, we, even, we've come a long way from that. Even through my career myself, I came into this, I hate to say how long ago, back in the mid 1980s, when um, Apple IIs were still around. Right. The transformation we've seen from technology just 
during my career has been mind boggling. Um, I remember shortly right after I got my job before I started the job at Kipik, a friend of mine said he'd read something about this new technology called adaptive optics and wondered what a, there was something about somehow canceling out the distortion of the atmosphere. And my response was, you can't do that. That just sounds like magic. And um, I made it my goal at that point to not only learn more about adaptive optics, but someday to understand it. And now, a few decades later, I've actually built a couple of adaptive optics benches. The transformation we've seen from all going back to high-speed digital computers has been mind-blowing. Um, we now deal with data processing in ways inconceivable back when I was an undergraduate. Um, CCDs have taken us from back film had a uh, quantum efficiency of what about 4%. We're now approaching 90, 95, 99% yeah. quantum efficiency. It is, it is what I would have thought when I was an undergraduate as impossible. So it has been an exciting career and I think there's still tremendous, tremendous opportunities ahead for us. Excellent, all right, so uh, no more questions like I said, I think people are still in shock with what they saw. This is like you've 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 literally covered every part of uh, everything that anybody could possibly ask. I'm sure there is going to be one person out there that's going to have another question at some point in time. But you know, if I get any more questions, um, of course they can still contact you through the website. Um, do you happen to have that slide up again? Because it's quite hey, a mouthful. Da, 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 da. Let me go see if I can go back and somehow, oh, I have to share a screen. How do, so I need to come back here, share a screen, share a screen, share. Yep, there it goes. And then, yeah, so you can leave it there. Okay. So for those of you who uh, wanna check out their website, remember bbsoweb dot, bbso dot njit dot edu. Or just so, Google Big Bear Solar Observatory. That too. If you Google Big Bear and astronomy, you'll get two hits, one for the Solar Observatory and one for our astronomy club, the Big Bear Valley Astronomical Society. Perfect. Uh, Matthew Henry says, Sophia and Gigi says hello. I still owe them an airplane ride. Uh-oh. <laughs> Thank God for the coronavirus that you don't have to fulfill that just now. <laughs> just now, that's true. Okay. Okay, uh, if that's if that's it, then I guess I'll let you go. And uh, I apologize for no, it, it was so. totally worth it. I don't mind um, running over for stuff like this. It, okay. it, it's it's worth every second. It really is. Okay, well, thank you so much, and uh, we'll see what the next decade brings. Yeah, and hopefully we'll see you back here for another event at some point. I'd be happy to. All right then. Thank you very Thank you. much, Clyde. Okay. Guys, we will be back later on with my tutorial. Um, until then, I am going to go on a quick break. So we're just going to play a couple of uh, videos and we'll catch you on the other side. So see you in just a moment.